Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Action Movie Show. My name is Carlos Alcazar, and with me is some random dude off the street. Yeah. Uh, Carlos, we got a problem here. Um, I think you have a problem. No, no, no. I, I think uh, technically the, the show has a problem. Uh, uh, well, I was dealing with a ninja earlier, and I was actually talking to him yesterday. I was picking up some stuff from EB Games, basically modern stuff. The guy doesn't touch any of stuff. But uh, when I was picking up like a, a pre-order of a game I picked up, uh, Persona 4 Arena uh, Ultra Max here, uh, he noticed there was a bear on the cover. And then, for some reason, I don't know, the, the guy gets set off by bears. He started freaking the fuck out. And it's like, bear! Bear! And then just started rambling around. And basically, he just kind of ran off somewhere, and I haven't seen or heard from him since. Yeah. So, uh, I think... I actually had to kind of really hastily uh, watch the movie. I saw a few loose notes, but I actually had to rewatch the movie uh, myself and put a few notes myself, and I think I'm going to have to cover this week. So what you're saying is you got in a fight with the ninja, and being that he's the most out-of-shape ninja in the world, you beat him. This is the cover story that the two of you could come up with. The guy's, the guy's a total psycho, man. I don't know. He's got issues. It's, I don't even really... I can't even say you actually see him doing any ninja stuff at this point. It's just basically what well, you have to think. You think ninja, you think this guy's gonna be like a flipping out, killing people all the time. I just see him play a lot of old video games. That's all I see him do anymore. I think the guy's out of work. You don't see a lot of ninjas anymore. He's for a lot of shit, so I don't know what's going on there. But that's not what we're here for, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, according to the notes, uh, this week's movie is a uh, uh, nice little ditty from. Uh, Starring Keanu Reeves, Dennis Hopper, and Sandra Bullock, called Speed, from 1994. So, let's just take a look here. Yeah, basically, your nice standard fare here. Biggest hits on Fox of Blu-ray. They say biggest hits, and then they show me Fantastic Four here. I don't know. I think that's, uh, they don't understand how that works. They, they, they were the greatest hits that were on Blu-ray at the time when it came out. I'll have to take the word for it, so, uh... How's this formatting on the show work? I, I don't honestly watch it. I can't tell you. Where do we go from here? Well, this is usually the part where I make fun of the ninja at some point here. Um, with that said, I suppose the easiest way to, to approach this with uh, with someone of your unique expertise, you fought the ninja, right? Honestly, you did. Man is... How the, how the hell do you fight some guy who hangs it on the ceiling and uh, I think he was kind of doing an Irish boxing thing? I don't know. The guy's weird. I don't think he even knows how the ninja thing, how it, being a ninja works there, but uh, apparently, uh, based on the body stuff at the berry, he, he knows something. Nobody ever said he was a good ninja. And besides, if he's going to be freaked out by the bear, he'd be freaked out by the stuffed bear, the stuffed Mortal Kombat bear you've got over there. It's called inconsistency in storyline. But anyway, with all, that, crazy. with all that said, uh, all things considered, what did you, you know, based on your notes, what did you, what did you find? What is your non-spoiler verdict on the movie 1994 Speed? Uh, generally, I actually have to say I actually really enjoyed the film. Uh, it's been a while since I've actually seen this film. Technically, the last version, or the last time I was seen, it must have been on like DVD or something like that, ages, or maybe watching when they're playing, maybe playing it off Spike, I think. So as they want to do, they play a lot of old movie stuff instead of actually showing new programming now. So, all right, uh, as Keanu Reeves, uh, I tend to say this is probably one of the better acting performances I've seen out of him. Not that he's exactly known for his acting, he's more known for being. An incredible pit of sorrow and sadness. I was gonna say this is a low bar we're going with here. This is not, you know, we're not we're not aiming high here. Yeah. I don't know. It's just all right. So in terms of, there, uh, I'd have to say honestly, it it does the, his acting does the job, which compared to some of the other stuff where he doesn't even get that far, we'll give him we'll give him a free pass on that one. Honestly, the action sequences and the driving sequences are actually really nice. I'd actually have to compliment them. I had actually forgotten how fun some of the uh, driving stuff and all the stunt work had been in this film. And, of course, your villain is an amusing, 
if not irritating at the time, nut bar. So it was fun to watch. Overall, so you would, uh, so I, I, I take it that you would recommend the film. Yeah, I could actually easily recommend this film. I'd say it's pretty fun. And how about you, girls? So what I would say is this movie is literally 20 years old right now. As of the time we're shoot, as of the time we're shooting this video, the movie, you know, 2014, 1994, is 20 years. It feels all of the 20 years that have gone by, and it's crazy to think that literally 20 years ago. So you have Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves in this movie, and Dennis Hopper is in this movie, and Jeff. Daniels, I believe, is in this movie. I believe it's Jeff Daniels. Yes, correct. Jeff Daniels and Alan Rock. So, like, there are some really, really solid actors in this movie. Uh, there are some decent acting performances in it as well. And the thing is, you you get some of the cheesiness. This, uh, you know, we'll cover a little bit more about it afterwards. But for the non-spoilery part, there are part times where you'll feel the fact that it's 1994, probably shot sometime in 1993. You'll feel that. Certain things happen here that don't make a lot of sense if you think about it in 2014. But with that said, if you just watch the movie as it's, it's supposed to be entertainment, it's, it's entertainment. Dennis Hopper as your villain is, is kind of fun. Uh, Keanu Reeves as your hero is serviceable. He, he's nothing special, but he's solid. He gets the job done. I think this is the first time, really, this was the star-making thing for uh, for Keanu Reeves, for sure. And for Sandra Bullock, it's hard for me to think if she was in anything like particularly notable before Speed came on. By the time she was in Speed, she was starting to like pick up steam. She would start making movies that uh, would be kind of a big deal. Let's take a quick peek. You know what? Demolition Man in 93 was probably more her star-making turn. Um, obviously, Keanu Reeves had been in the Bill and Ted movies by that point. Um, but there's a difference between, yeah, you're in Bill and Ted, you've got a couple of lines you know, that people remember, that's, that's a thing. And, well, we've gone, like, you can't contrast anything more than Bill and Ted versus now you're actually, we're, we're trying to sell you as an action star. And I think, I really think because of this movie is pretty much the reason why he was able then to go into and do The Matrix, which became successful for him later. So highly recommended, definitely a watchable movie, something worth watching for everybody. So that's kind of a non-spoiler review without really going into any plot details. If you're interested in what, if you actually, are, if you're a younger person that hasn't actually had the chance to see the movie, this would be a great time to like pause the video or stop the video. Go check it out. Um, I don't think it's on Netflix right now, at least not in Canada, it's not. Um, it might be in the American Netflix or other international Netflixes. Um, but if you get if you get a chance, you know, that movie is gonna be in the bargain bit. You're gonna be able to probably get it for about five bucks or less than ten bucks for sure, even on Blu-ray. Um, definitely worth a, worth a pickup because it is a fun movie to watch here and there. Go check it out in some capacity, and then feel free to come back, and you can listen to a little bit more of us running down certain things about the movie. So if you're doing that, feel free to come back. Uh, for those of you who have already seen the movie and want to kind of revisit some of the old things, stick around. We're going to cover a little bit more of that. But uh, why don't we do this, Mr. A? Question mark. What what struck you about this movie? Well, uh, th we're, I'm going to start a bit off the uh, the ninja's notes here. Uh, first of all, we, uh, he wants to congratulate them on the high quality logo, uh, which uh, I, I swear I think you could do that in clip art with at this point modern versions and even a couple of older versions back of uh, Microsoft Word. You could do a similar logo job and introduction sequence. Uh, personally, I want to note the music <coughs> sounded familiar to me. Uh, technically, uh, I actually had Carlos look this up just before we went on the air for this year. And uh, as it turns out, this film, being in 94, uh, predates uh, what I was originally thinking when I was like, thinking, this actually sounds like something that Konami did uh, for the Metal Gear Solid, the first Metal Gear Solid game, which was made in 98. And as everyone knows, the director for that series loves to reference movie stuff. Basically, uh, 
the initial character is like based off of uh, Snake Plissken from uh, Escape from New York. Uh, there's a bunch of other film references on there. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bit of a music riff or two in that setup that was actually referenced in one of the main musical themes used in that later game. So uh, just kind of want to point to there. Uh, we have, uh, during the whole initial elevator stint, uh, Keanu Reeves and his partner effectively wondering, is like, why do we keep doing this job? And it kind of seems like they're contemplating how long before they can say they're too old for this shit, because that's something cops have to do. It just seems to be kind of a running rule when it comes to cops and movies. I don't know what's going on there. Now, and, uh, since you brought it up, can I can I show something that uh, is going to kind of make our point here? Sure. All right. So let me pull up my old screen share deal. Uh, let me get that on here. Give me one second. There we go. And let's do that. All right. So here we go. All right. So I'm just going to pull that up on my side, and then I'll bring it up for you guys. Okay. So here we go. All right, so this is a kind of a screen grab from uh, from good old Speed. Uh, this is Keanu Reeves and Jeff Daniels at the beginning of the movie. They're going to uh, uh, at the beginning of the movie. Basically, the initial thing that causes these guys to have to kind of spring into action is that someone, as we find out, is Dennis Hopper, has uh, has triggered has set up dynamite on an elevator. And he did it in such a way that the elevator was knocked downward and is suspended in an office building uh, using high explosives. That's basically how he managed to do it. So using high explosives, he managed to blow up part, uh, you know, part of what was holding an elevator up, knocked it down, but the elevator emergency brakes, I suppose, uh, kicked in. So the elevator is suspended right now in an office building. They called in the bomb squad and the SWAT team and all those guys because... The you, it was an explosion that caused it, and they were able to determine because uh, demands were made and called in that they basically were told that there's another explosive device set to blow, and if it blows, it's going to send the elevator crashing straight down because it's going to eliminate the brakes that are basically keeping the people suspended. Normally, if an elevator goes down like this, you just get the repair guys to come in, they open the door, they let everybody out, and then they fix the elevator. But, you know, one thing that I think is right that they do here in the movie correctly is that they actually get everybody to kind of wonder. It's like, you know, why, you know, once it becomes obvious that the police are there, it's like, well, why is the police here? Why isn't it the elevator guys? That's who they're expecting. And obviously the police are trying not to tell them, oh, by the way, there's a bomb attached to your elevator. All of you have to sit there. We're, we're doing this because we can't just run over and just open the door for you. We have to try to deal with this first. So it leads to the first sequence where these guys basically save the day. Um, you know, we're not going to elaborate too much on that. We want to leave a little bit of fun for you guys in the movie. But the bottom line is Keanu Reeves' partner here is Jeff Daniels. Now, i got to be blunt with you. Uh, remember, this is 1994. Keanu Reeves hasn't done The Matrix, hasn't done all these other, you know, Devil's Advocate, Constantine, whatever. At this point, he's pretty much the Bill and Ted guy. Or I think... Breaking Point, or I forget what it, what was the movie. Um, there wasn't a lot on the resume that would suggest to you that Keanu Reeves is going to be an action hero of any type, shape, shape, or form. And Jeff Daniels is, you know, I, I've known him from some other movies and things, so I'm going to take this off the screen now. So it should come back to me. There we go. Jeff Daniels, at this point, again, 1994, we always have to factor that in, uh, he's no, he's done other things, but not too many things, I think, that would sell to you, again, that he's going to be an action hero per se. I'm just going to take a look here. Uh, he was an episode of Frasier. I'm just looking at his IMDb. Like, I'm just looking here. I don't even see arachnophobia. No. Um, radio days. Nope. Like, I'm literally... Terms of Endearment, he was in that. Okay. Um, yeah, like, there isn't really anything here, necessarily, either, that suggests to me. So basically, those two guys I just showed you, they're our heroes at the outset of this movie, which is a bit... I don't know if you could tell with the glare on the glasses that I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit. It's not the first thought you have when you're looking at these guys. So, you know, fair enough. Whatever, we're trying to sell something. They were trying to get out of what they had been doing. And it worked out great for both these guys. They both had careers well stretching beyond this. Sandra Bullock obviously has had a long career. 
since then. And Dennis Hopper has a lengthy career. So all these people have done well. Um, at the point of this movie, though, those two guys, for me, knowing what I know now, seem a little out of place in context of 1994. But this is how you make people. You have to step outside of your comfort zone. So that's, you know, it's cool that they did that. But it totally feels like 1994 when they come out with it. And as uh, Mr. A points out, the opening credits, they do feel like clip art font. It's like the cheapest thing in the world. And literally the music that they're playing that he's referring to, all you're seeing for like the first three minutes of the film, and I'll have to pull up my own notes, which I will do so in a moment, but it's almost three or four minutes that's just showing us moving from floor to floor. It's basically showing, yes, it's an elevator. No, really, it's an elevator. But we have to no, show no, no. Everybody elevator moving. shaft. Elevator shaft. Not yeah. the actual elevator itself. Wonderful. The point is, oh, that's all we're seeing. It's that, just as they show every single person they have to give credit to at the outset of the movie, which is very exciting, as you can imagine, for three and a half minutes of that. I'll be right back. Oh, seriously, leaving. Oh, wait, no, I know it's not. I was going to say, feel free to feel free to chime in here in, in any part you want. All right, okay. Uh, okay, loading up notes. Okay, at this point, we've basically gone through... Uh, we're going to just skip past the whole hostage situation setup and uh, as I momentarily ignore what's going on on Skype. Uh, at this point, now we happen to have uh, the, the first showdown with the actual bomb maker... Who it, it's actually surprising. We see the bomb maker this early in there, and we actually get to see his face, and the bat, and the the cops actually get to see who this is. This is kind of what you don't expect so much, or at least at this point you don't expect them to do. It's kind of one of those general movie tropes. I think, where, though, in fairness, if I may interject a point, but I'll let you continue by all yeah. means. I I would just say though, it's not really a procedural. It's not really a cop drama. The drama isn't that. You know, we have to figure out who the bomb maker is. It's a race against time. Yeah. We want to know who the bomb maker is at, right off the bat, as soon as possible, because he is a character. He's not just a caricature of a bomb maker. Dennis Hopper's a, a great actor, so we want to know who this guy is because he's going to play into what's going to unfold. Yeah, but pretty much, uh, generally in this case, just because they want to make sure you get a good use out of the actor. Because he was quite good in his job, he did really well in this role. But generally speaking, most of the time, especially you have like a kind of a terrorist figure, you don't get a good look at the guy, or a, a direct interaction between him and the protagonist of the film until much later on in the film, usually closer to the film's conclusion. But in this case, we meet him early on, uh, just after his plan had been foiled, and uh, after a little tense standoff, he seemingly kills himself. So right now we have the Aftermath of that, the character, all the cops are getting congratulated, a good job well done, and things seem to be slowly moving on, only to uh, pan out to really, oh, the, no, the bomb maker actually isn't dead, and this is really just the start. We're literally still at the beginning of the film, stuff has been blown up there, we've already had a few injuries and casualties, technically, not actual deaths, but casualties and uh, injuries and such, and the stuff's only just starting to go down. So at this point, okay... We introduce the next bit where the main film actually occurs. The first bus blows up. It's like, let me see. There's a note here. This is from my part of the note. Where uh, you have uh, Keanu's character being greeted by uh, the bus driver in that area. Hello, Bob. How are you doing? Only for Bob to get blown up mere seconds after he gets on his own bus. And then we had the random phone call. Because you can easily call, back in 94, you can easily call random toll booths, apparently. Pay phones. Yeah, random pay phones. I just don't even remember that. You don't you don't see that shit anymore. You really well, don't. This is one of the ones... Remember I was saying earlier... I'm just going to come back here for one yeah. second. Remember when I was saying earlier, there are certain times in the movie where you remember it's 1994? We don't do cell phones. Cell phones exist. Yeah, they're, they're but they're, they're closer to the brick phones with the big antennas. People have them. People have car phones. You know... For those of you who are a little bit younger, I'm just gonna just letting you know, this is did the internet exist? It did, but it was really very very basic compared to what you're looking at right now, or compared to what you're you know you, when you're surfing around right now as we speak, completely different than what we're talking about. 
1994, it's nothing like that. Cell phones are a lot larger. Very few people have them. They're expensive as hell, and realistically, most people didn't need them. So how does Dennis Hopper get a hold of Keanu Reeves? No, since he knows. You know, part of his thing is that he's got cameras all over the place. He's observing people so that he knows what they're doing. Well, how does he get a hold of them? He calls the payphone that's nearby. And then, of course, instinctively, Keanu Reeves knows Right after this bus has exploded, the payphone ringing nearby must be related. So, of course, he's going to go pick up the payphone, you know, pick up the receiver for the payphone and talk to the person on the other end of the line. At which point he discovers that our bomber is still alive. Let the rest yeah. of the scene play out. It sets up what's going to happen next. Yeah. One point I did want to make from what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I did enjoy, in contrast to the movie that was done last, last week, um, where John Cena in the Marine did not understand the basic premise of selling a concussion wave in an explosion. Keanu Reeves knew, at least, we can argue all we want about his acting, at least he and the people who wrote the script know how to sell a concussion wave. After Dennis Hopper presumably blows himself up, the explosion comes through the door, blowing inward in an enclosed space. Keanu Reeves goes flying backwards, and then is knocked out. Knocked out, he doesn't get back up and run after the presumed corpse of Dennis Hopper. That's because, and this is a sentence you probably won't hear people say a lot of, Keanu Reeves is a better actor than that person. That's probably why. Blasphemy! I don't know, I can't even say I watch WWE products anymore, World Wrestling. I want to say WWF because that's back when I used to watch that stuff. Andrew, they had a lot more colorful characters. And an occasional maniac running around with a lot of face paint and some arm tassels that probably were tightened too tight. But that's another story entirely. Also, I, I want all of you to know, it took all my willpower not to do... Whoa. Yeah, that's why you had to do it just then, of course. Yes, it is, actually. All right. So, at this point... We have Keanu Reeves' character running off in order to get a hold of, uh, uh, track down the buses. Now has the bomb on it. Now that we know the general premise of what this whole movie is going to be all about, and of course now we go back to the police station, which they, in case you didn't realize what was going on from the scene just before, they redo the exposition to reveal that they just learned that the bomb maker is alive and has pretty much set the bomb on the, the whole bus there. Just in case you didn't get it from the very scene before that just took place. And, uh, of course, uh, now we have a general chase down, or a chase. The first of the driving chase scenes where Keanu's character tries to rush down to the bus, preferably, losing, preferably before it hits the 50 mile per hour mark, which we can clearly see start going into place because they break every other scene or every other bit of the video in order to show the speedometer slowly creeping up towards 50 until finally it creeps over. So now we have to go to a more elaborate chase scene where he hijacks this guy with a customized car plate. Uh, I can't remember. What the hell did that plate say? Did you jot that down, Carlos? I didn't catch it. Yeah, I, I know it's a customized plate. It's pretty much uh, some kind of a cheesy uh, message, and I don't remember what it is, though. And, okay, now they've got to chase down the car or chase down the bus, which everyone on the bus is looking at. is like, this guy's completely insane. And, of course, now we have this get him on the bus, which the only way to do so is first write down on a piece of paper a note the bus driver can actually see so he knows there's a bomb on the bus, which, well, the, the actual car owner tries to show properly, but as he falls over, the thing hits the windshield wiper, just stays there just long enough for the bus rider to or the bus driver to actually see the message. And he realizes he's in deep shit now. So, all right, he's about to slow it down, gets waved off. They go to the uh, passenger side, where, despite not being able to hear Keanu's character this whole time prior, even though r literally creeping up on driver's side window, suddenly he's able to hear. It's like, whatever you do, don't drop below 50. If you do that, that's what set off the bomb. And suddenly he, the bus driver can suddenly hear things again. Maybe he's just had something wrong with his left ear. Maybe that when I explain things. Indeed. Okay. Now, again, I'm going to interject here with a real quick thing. Um, two things that struck me about this. First is it did serve to add the drama to the movie, and you needed that for, for, this, for this movie to work. 
By the way, I think part of the success of Speed is that it borrowed the formula that worked so well for Die Hard in the sense that your action is within a confined space. You have the car chase scenes. You have all that happening. But the bomb is inside of a city bus. The people that are at stake are inside of the same bus. The hero is on the bus. The love interest is on the bus. They're all within like visual short range of each other. If the bomb goes off, the people on the bus are going to die. You know, maybe people around it will get hurt as well. There'll be collateral damage, but relatively speaking, it's the people inside the bus that are most in jeopardy, especially once they get the bus away from people. They're really the ones in danger the whole time. But you can confine almost all the drama, so to speak, inside of this confined space, and in effect, you manage to get more interest in, like, keep people's attention inside of a confined room. In reality, you, the actors, never left the confined space of this bus. Which is funny because, you know, you have all these other movies that go through these elaborate changes of scenery, all these things, and still can't capture as much as they were able to do inside of the equivalent of one city bus. Which is interesting in its own way. The second thing is that I did find it a bit convoluted. Again, it worked for dramatic purposes. I did find it convoluted that in order to trigger the bomb, we need it to go over 50. As soon as we do that, the bomb is armed. As soon as we do that, if we drop below 50, the bomb blows up. If somebody tries to escape, he can remote detonate the bomb. Great. Sounds good. Why did we need to hit 50 in order for the damn thing to activate? If he can remote detonate the thing anytime he wants, he could have just gone with that. The 50 mile an hour thing is just to give us an excuse to do what we're going to do later, which is fine for the movie, I get it. But from the standpoint of uh, Dennis Hopper's character, who wants to get paid off? He's mad because he was like a bomb squad guy who was either forced to retire or whatever the case is, and he wants to get paid off. He wants money. So if you set up a bus so that you have to stay above 50 in order to keep it from going off, and you know it's going to take a certain amount of time to get this money in best case scenario, this is still 1994, we can't immediately do things necessarily. We can't wire money per se. We can still do it, but it's a lot tougher. And wiring is trackable and all that. But the thing is, if you succeed in this plan, there's a certain amount of time you need. The bus is going to run out of real estate to stay above 50, to keep the consistent thing. This movie, it takes place in L.A., L.A. traffic means you're going to run into resi resistance in the form of other cars being in your way, which works towards the movie, but again, doesn't make any damn sense from the standpoint of if you're the villain in this movie. Uh, it, I imagine it's really that the bus, all extents, has plot armor, is what's going on here, to how it manages to swerve and just barely either dodge or plow through everything it needs to in order to keep the whole thing working. And generally, let's be honest, if we were going to realism, it'd be a much shorter movie, for one, and it wouldn't be as entertaining, because the, a very large, normally lumbering city bus is having to make all these nice, sharp, tight maneuvers in order to get that, which, quite frankly, it's being uh, driven uh, at first by a regular bus driver, and then by someone who just had their license revoked for speeding, and technically... Uh, shouldn't be as good at driving as she turned out to be throughout the course of this film. And that's what keeps it exciting. And that's what actually makes it entertaining. No, for sure. Uh -oh. And Sandra Bullock does a great job in this, kind of selling that part of it. But the point that I was making mainly was, you probably could have made it work if it was just, by the way, if anybody tries to get off this bus, I'm blowing it up. By, speedy, by having the speeding element of it to keep it above this thing, also kind of does make sense in one way. By having the bus have to speed everywhere, you have that television coverage. Because if they just stop the bus somewhere, you would still get television coverage because you have all these police converging on the bus staring at it. Uh, nobody being able to make a move on it in fear that he'll remote detonate the bomb. It would be a standoff movie instead of like a rolling, moving 
action movie. You're still inside of this confined space, but the confined space is constantly in motion, and the world around it impacts what this confined space, what the drama inside the confined space is, which works. It actually works quite well. But another reason that I said, like, like what entertained me is that this movie works, but it doesn't necessarily work outside of this era. Because if you try the same movie with the same, if you try to redo the movie, how can you deal with this issue? If the bomb is armed when you go above 50, you make a phone call on your cell phone to the, to the police station. The police station ra dis radios the dispatch for the bus company. The right. bus company says, you slow the damn thing down. They did explain that the radio on that bus was sabotaged. They did actually mention that fairly early on in the film. That was actually also, uh, actually, to be exact, that was on the initial phone call to Keanu uh, from the bomber. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Um, they, 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 I didn't catch that, but in that case, they covered that little plot hole. Fair enough. But to put it another way, they would probably try to figure out who's on the bus quickly. They would be able yeah. to, because they're told which bus it is. As soon as they can't reach him on the radio, they would... St buses, a lot of the buses now, not all, but a lot of buses in those fleets have trackers on them so that you know where the bus is, so you can track it down rather quickly. Well, what you would do is you would literally get the closest person to get near that bus, and you would have the same thing. Like, they would slow the bus down before it ever has the chance to hit 50, assuming somebody's close enough by. Realistically, if they were to do realistic, then they'd also upgrade the technology involved, and that would just add another layer in order to just kind of explain how it might be plausible. Not entirely realistic, but plausible, let's yeah. be honest. I think, ironically, if you tried to update it that way, it would actually make the movie worse. Even if you could do almost everything else the same way, it wouldn't work. I'm forgetting that we've already seen the movie, but I, th I think it would struggle to to get that built in. Um, All right, well, Carlos reviews his notes. Generally what happens uh, now that the bus is officially over 50, so we have it careening kind of slowly out of control on the highway, then going on through city streets, streets basically just barely missing everything. At this point, they now have a police escort that directs them to what's supposed to be an abandoned bit of a uh, highway, which is good. It gives them opportunity to try some stuff. Only, oh yeah, it turns out the highway wasn't actually finished, so for more excitement, we now actually have to speed up the bus farther to jump over a gap in the highway in order to uh, keep from basically crashing into the uh, ground below. And this is where it leads us officially to that point, to, okay, we're actually taking this now in circles around an airport area, the uh, the LAX. And now this is kind of where the movie kind of hits uh, kind of a temporary pause, at least on the bus, while some other events start going around on the outside. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, having the rolling bus dynamic to it kind of keeps that going. But at the same time, yeah, as soon as they hit this airport, run, as soon as they're in the airport and they can circle the bus around, they can they can maintain the speed, do all that, and then you add elements of drama. You know, Keanu Reeves in trying to deactivate the bomb basically finds himself in a position where he's underneath the bus. He almost gets run over and crushed by the bus, but in the process, you know, breaks the fuel tank, and then it's leaking fuel. So eventually, it's going to run out of fuel. So we we would have to refill the bus because we've only got a certain amount of time. So it creates a time constraint. You've got the bomber's own self-imposed deadline. You've got the monitoring. You've got all that going on. Oh, actually, we I think we actually overlooked a bit of the monitoring there. It's around this part of the film. Everywhere previously, there had been a bunch of television crews and such that were following them, which is where everyone had thought how they were being surveilled. Uh, or there was surveillance going on from the bomber. But as it turns out, as it's everything circling and literally everything circling down the drain because the fuel tank's been punctured at this point, that's when it becomes apparent that from a re list kind of a rethinking out one of the comments that Bomber said, they realize that they were being remotely watched within the actual bus itself. Because while all the cell phone stuff and everything's primitive, there was a small camera tucked into the corner, one of the upper corners of the front of the bus, that had been watching them the whole time. Which actually gets played directly in this part of the next plot point. 
Now, specifically the comment that they're referring to, which Keanu Reeves brilliantly deduces after the fact, is that um, is that when referring to the driver, uh, Sandra Bullock's character, um, Dennis Hopper keeps referring to her as the Wildcat. Um, well, she was wearing a sweater for the for Arizona University, whose team is the Wildcats. Or I think it was Arizona University. Yeah, I, I think, think that's what it was. Yeah, regardless, that's the reference that he was referring to because he could see it. That's how Keanu Reeves figured it out. And then that's where they come up with a brilliant idea of how they're going to get everybody off the bus. But before we get to that, I'm going to make a point and then we'll, we'll reveal the conclusion of Speed. By the way, one more time. We've already covered. We're into the spoiler element of it, though. The ending is actually kind of fun. So if you haven't watched it, you can still come back and catch the and we'll talk about the ending. But I will make a point. So if you're going to watch the movie, I'll pause for one second. All right, I'm assuming you've watched the movie. If you have, you know, feel free to stick around then. Um, one thing that I did that I did find entertaining, we're going to cover how Keanu Reeves brilliantly comes up with his plan to save the people. Small issue I had with it. Dennis Hopper has basically a GPS on the bus. It's shown on one of his computer monitors. He can see the location of the bus, and the computer monitor also is telling him the speed of the bus and is telling him basic information about it. Now, if you could, Mr. Ray, can you explain how Keanu Reeves is going to fool Dennis Hopper into thinking that the bus is continuing in motion? Well, it turns out the way they get around it is once they realize that there is, they're being remotely watched from uh, some kind of a relayed feed, they end up going and basically the, the police that are on the outside come in their uh, television truck, get them somehow to discover the frequency of the feed, which I'm not sure how they pull that off, but once they somehow manage to figure that out, they have them record a short one-minute loop of everyone standing relatively still and putting that on replay to keep playing it after after hijacking the feed, so that one-minute feed would keep being looped again and again to hypothetically make the uh, bomber think that uh, everything was still going hunky-dory. And I guess he didn't bother to refer to either the uh, the GPS, if there was one. I don't think I saw one there, to be honest. And he didn't... Well, actually, no. The one map they showed was for the area he was in. They didn't actually show where the bus was. Maybe that might have something to do with it. And, of course, he didn't really pay attention to what's going on there because partway he went through the restroom when the switch originally began. And for the rest of the time, he wasn't even watching the news feed itself. He was actually watching a football game that was going on. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at it. I'm pretty sure they did have a thing where it was showing like the little icon of the bus, and I think it did have a GPS on it. I think it was giving the location of the bus, and I think it had the speed on of the bus and everything that was supposed to be happening. Like I said, that's how they were planning on fooling him. So they did that. They evacuated everybody off the bus, not without an extra smidge of drama, just to make it very dramatic at the end because Alan Ruck was the last one to get off the bus of the regular passengers. Uh, so he barely got off the bus before they hit, I think it was um, something that was on the, something that ended up on the tarmac or the tire exploded because it had already been worn down. Yeah. And then he was knocked forward, but he was already on like a little ramp they had set up. So they're being, he's being dragged on the ramp there while people are holding him to keep him there and pulling him into the bus. So they managed to pull him in there, and then Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves escape the bus, basically sliding underneath it through one of the access hatches. Here's the thing. After that, to get, to get our, you know, we haven't used our special effects budget completely. So in order to meet that quota, the bus then rides effectively on autopilot through the high-tech use of tying the steering wheel to part of the bus. Through the high-tech use, it effectively drives right into an airplane, which allows you to have the satisfying explosion of the bomb going off, the bus exploding, and then the plane exploding, after which they had slid all the way to safety, you know, getting off the bus. Great. At that point, the GPS and also the speedometer at the computer monitor would say zero, 
Dennis Hopper still hasn't noticed this. He notices it several minutes later after the people had already been taken off the bus and Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock are already in an ambulance being ca carted off. Oh, technically, he doesn't notice it because of any kind of GPS or speedometer. That's what I'm saying. He didn't look at it. He yeah, didn't even he, pay attention he, to it. They were sitting right there beside yeah. it. Here's how he noticed it. There was a problem with the loop. Someone had moved the purse. They had the purse on the lap, and they moved it elsewhere. And the, note, the movement of the purse just magically popping in and out of the scene, that's what tipped him off that something was wrong uh, when the money was being dropped. Because for quite some time, he didn't realize the thing was on loop still and that there was an issue in his plan. Indeed. And that led us, that led us into the final bit. <gasps> In the spirit of silliness, Keanu Reeves, being the hero, insists on being in the vicinity where the drop is going to take place. They have figured out, more or less, where the guy is. You know, at least within reasonable. They know where the drop is going to be, so they're going to monitor the drop. Of course, Dennis Hopper can see the snipers because they're the worst camouflage snipers in the world. So he, he's got a plan in order to get the money, obviously, in the drop. Whatever. Um... But Keanu Reeves is nearby the drop zone, and he asks the ambulance guys to stop. So he gets out there in order to kind of keep an eye on the thing. Sandra Bullock's in the ambulance. By this point, Dennis Hopper has realized that he's been tricked. He's not a happy camper. He was an ex-police officer. He has a uniform. Slaps the uniform on, makes his way around. As he's walking around, he's probably planning on making his getaway at that point, presumably. But he realizes that Sandra Bullock is there. He recognizes her, the back of her head from, from the video and from what he's seen. So he manages to realize that it is, in fact, her. And then being looking like a police officer, she doesn't know what he looks like. Keanu Reeves does, and he's inside a barber shop, so he's not there. So he escorts her, and she becomes his hostage. We get a standoff, you know, a little bit of a chase, a standoff with Keanu Reeves and... Uh, if I might interject, actually... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you did let the leave off a point. The the money drop. Uh, as it turns out, even if there was no witness or no hostage, technically the money drop would have gone completely unnoticed because it turns out at the trash can which was used there, he managed to drill a hole not only through the trash can but entirely through to the subway tunnels underneath there, where they didn't realize until Keanu Reeves ran out there and knocked over the trash can, see the big hole. That they would have actually, he would have actually gone away scot clean that way. He didn't even need to take the hostage. Hey, he saw Shawshank Redemption. He was excited. Maybe. Plus, he was still mad that he didn't get to blow up his bus with people in it. Looks like it. For, uh, yeah. No, I didn't forget. I was just going to cover that. The thing is, um, the ch there is the little brief chase thing. Um, in the end. The, the final perilous situation, which leads into our final sequence, is Sandra Bullock is handcuffed with a bomb strapped to her. She's handcuffed inside of a subway car uh, while Dennis Hopper's there with a dead man's... I think it's a dead man's switch. It's yeah. basically a trigger yeah, where a, if he releases it, it's like a grenade. When you release the thing, within a moment or two, the bomb would go off. So... You know, it basically protects him because if anybody does anything to cause him to open his hand and drop it, that's it. Bomb goes off. Um, so he's got a hostage. They're on the subway. The only person left stuck on the subway with them is Keanu Reeves, who, who catches up to the subway train, and the driver. Once he sees the driver try to reach for his radio, he shoots the driver to get rid of him. And then you end up in a sequence where now Dennis Hopper is trying to take out Keanu Reeves they end up fighting on top of the subway car. So, uh, do you want to kind of review how we Dennis Hopper meets his untimely end? Yeah, this is actually a fun scene. Well, the man is basically Dennis Hopper is gloating the whole time. Uh, Keanu, having actually dodged one of these like little uh, station lights just above the subway area, uh, can see that one's coming up and deliberately doesn't try to push Dennis Hopper away from him or off of him but actually tries to force his head as far up, far upward as he can so that it ended up getting completely taken off. Dennis Hopper was decapitated. 
And when uh, asked by Sandra Bullock's character what happened, just has to say, oh, the guy lost his head. One liner. style bad pun. It's that's that's how you do the one liners. And you said the man can't act. You're it entirely right, but at least he can do some one liners right now. On the bad pun man. Yeah. Hey, it worked all over the eighties, and it was only, it was just before mid nineties, still applicable. Charisma not included. You're asking too much there. Fine. So. Decapitated Dennis Hopper is now out of the picture. Time for the hero to save the lady. Problem. She's handcuffed. Problem. The blood from the dead driver is wrecking the controls, so he can't stop the subway train. Uh, not the blood. I I'd say more the various bullets that got shot into the console did. I actually think it was at least partially the blood, only because the bullet holes were there. That's a big deal. But it's short-circuited. And they really put a lot of blood on top of the dash. And it's an electronic circuit. I'd say at that point, it's probably a bit of column A, a bit of column B, and a bit of, we need to make this more dramatic. So, okay, uh, we can't stop this thing. And it's not an out-of-control bus anymore. Now it's an out-of-control subway thing. And, oh, Wait, yeah. Let me uh, set it up. Let me set it up. Okay. Hold on. All right. We can't stop the subway car. The hero... He's trying to save the girl with dynamite strapped to her. They need they can't get off this thing now. She's stuck to this pole and they can't remove the pole, so they can't escape the subway car. So what's the solution? More of course, you didn't want to go say more speed, but you left out the part that oh, it turns out the track they're on isn't finished. Because we haven't had enough things where Oh, yeah, by the way, you have a very short time limit, and you're going to crash into something real soon. So, all right, how are we going to get out of this? Why not speed up the subway thing so fast that it'll go off the rails and into somewhere that isn't populated, hypothetically? So they send the thing careening through. I love the irony of this, uh, which actually goes up on the street level right through a sign that is basically one of those accident-free signs saying that, place have been accident free for like over 200 days, crashes right through that damn thing, and then it comes to a halt in the middle of the street. Everyone is saved, and uh, that's how the movie ends. Well, and then they make out. Yeah. And then, the most important thing, they do reference that Sandra Bullock did say that relationships based on traumatic experiences don't last, in which case she has to retort, that's basically true, so we'll base it on sex, which he agrees. Which makes it really awkward when they actually made Speed 2, which they probably shouldn't have done, so Sandra Bullock had to explain away, it's like basically trying to explain away Keanu Reeves' character. It's best we don't think about the sequels. Probably shouldn't have happened. Yeah. First one, first one was pretty solid, so it worked out overall. You have a, it, it, it follows the checklist. It's not on the level. Die Hard to me is still probably the high watermark of a great action movie. However, it does meet a couple of the checklists. Action movies inside of confined spaces can be dramatic if done well. Check. The hero has to be at least reasonable. The hero took shots, because even at the end, Dennis Hopper was not a young guy when these made this movie, but he was still credible as a villain because he was kind of kicking the crap out of Keanu Reeves on top of the subway car. At and least he was willing to get his hands dirty. He's also equally skilled, obviously being a former cop himself. So it's an even, aside from a little bit of age gap, which quite frankly didn't seem too significant, it was still an, a level playing field. Yeah, and he was a formidable challenger. He had plans. He had planned well. Most of what he was doing made sense. Uh, you know, for comedic relief, he got a little sloppy at certain points, which made the plot work. But that's fine. Uh, Sandra Bullock was a great love interest slash, like you know, she was part of what was needed to get the job done in the end. Uh, so they had her as that character. But even some of the assistant characters were kind of good. Alan Ruck was kind of a good. Kind of comedy relief guy. Um, you have the one guy there that, you know, the one big guy who was, like, helping him out. 
So even the passengers were kind of hands-on in trying to make this work. You created kind of a teamwork solidarity thing on the bus, which, given the you know variety of actors they use and actresses they use for this, worked. Um, you know, pretty good casting on that as well. And then your police sergeant was pretty good. Uh, we did leave out, alas, when they went to try to raid the house of Dennis Hopper, Jeff Daniels was sadly blown to smithereens. Yeah, I'm basically imagine that the house was pretty much long banded and was booby trapped with explosives, to which they realized had left pretty much a very long pause to realize, yep, your luck ran out. And Jeff Daniels was a really lucky guy in this movie because in the previous, they bookended it. You had two of those little standoffs. In the first one, they defeated Dennis Hopper by Keanu Reeves shooting Jeff Daniels in the leg, knocking him down, causing Dennis Hopper to basically run away, and then release the trigger, triggering the explosion, faking his own death. However, he for his trouble, he got a desk job and then got blown to smithereens because he insisted on storming the house himself. The lesson for everyone, as always... If you have a mad bomber with a police background, don't raid his house. It's probably booby trapped with explosives. Did say bad. And I think this is a fair lesson. This is where like the the more you know should like appear on the screen if we had some editing. All right. Uh, so I, I uh, personally, I've kind of run out of things to say about this. Generally, overall, really good film. A little dated with some of the technology and stuff there. But uh, still, I'd say still holds up pretty well, and is definitely worth watching, owning. You can find this for probably pretty cheap, ladies and gentlemen. So, why not? I wouldn't recommend the sequel, though. There's one, only one sequel. Know. There's only the one sequel? Here, let's, uh, let's, let's not deprive the people. I can at least there do it. There we that. go. I feel better already. There we go. We did it, everybody. Sure, we don't have editing, but we got this. Check it out. Oh yeah, it's pretty solid. I'm excited about it. How about you? I feel, I feel my day's been enriched. Oh. I think so. Yeah. So uh, what do we do next here? Excellent question. So, in the spirit of our fallen comrade, who was sadly killed by Mister A, because we know he killed him. Look at that face. Uh, if that actually, isn't the face, uh, of he, did, he did drop something before he left. If that isn't the face of murderous rage. I don't know what is. How can you trust anyone with that mustache? Man's clearly yeah. psychotic. I'm still looking at you. That's right. Yeah, I don't I want know. everybody to look at you and understand that yeah. you are the face of evil. Enough of it. All right. Uh, Shameless plug. He, he did drop something though before he freaked out. What did he drop? He dropped this thing. I don't know. Is this supposed to mean anything to you? Oh, somebody's fancy. You know what the problem is? Is that the new Godzilla movie? Yeah, that's the, this is the newest one, yeah. I saw yeah, it in yeah, theaters yeah. myself. Do they have the alternate edition with the guy inside of a suit in Japanese dubbing? Because otherwise, no one cares. Uh, let's see. Uh, Blu-ray plus DVD plus digital HD ultraviolet. I, I don't know. If there's an alternate thing on... I'll look it up for you. Redeem code by 2017. Indeed. Well, we're going to do shameless plugging in one second. I will say that we hadn't figured out uh, what the next couple of movies were going to be. We did think that we were going to do a Godzilla movie. Appropriate that he has the Godzilla movie. But the thing is, it's not a real Godzilla movie. None of the current movies are real Godzilla movies. They're fake. Anything with a CGI Godzilla doesn't count. I want a guy in a suit and bad dubbing. However, I think a fair compromise, given that that movie is in physical presence, I think what we should do for the next show, for the next edition of the Action Movie Show is I think we'll review that film in your possession. But we will also review, in contrast, a legitimate Godzilla film. Maybe Mothra, maybe something else I haven't decided yet. One of them. I think that is the best compromise that satisfies the thirst for the new Godzilla film 
that is a shadow of real Godzilla. Uh, if, if you're talking shadow, then I think you need to go for the last American Godzilla. The one that no one talks about. Anything that isn't a guy in a suit and bad dubbing is a shadow. It's a shameful ripoff. It's like Speed 2. It shouldn't happen. You hear me, Japan? Yeah. If it's not a guy in a suit and bad dubbing, never make another Godzilla movie ever. You want to make a Godzilla movie? I want it on cheap film. I want a guy in a suit where it's obvious it's a guy in a suit. And I want bad dubbing whether you need it or not. I don't care if the people know how to speak English. I want bad dubbing. I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing a message on Skype here. Uh, it's pretty much from uh, it looks like a, a the ninja has mentioned something about uh, right now he's uh, doing some work or he's looking at Jim Henson's workshop and. Uh, Basically, talk about Jim Henson's workshop, uh, potato chips, and uh, I, d I don't know, want to know how the hell that works. That can't end well. You know, we could have prevented this if you just killed him. He, he's not very hard to kill. In fact, if you give him enough chips, the cholesterol might do it. He's pretty out of shape. I don't know, man. I'm just stating facts here. No can, question can you, has he been talking about puppets again? He's, he's been doing that a lot lately. That, that's all he talks about. Just give him enough chips. He'll die of like cholesterol anyway. So, uh, to grab his notes, shamelessly plug something. All right. Uh, based on here, okay, I, I, we, all know, we all know about his Twitter account, which makes no sense. He talks about a lot of weird shit there. Uh, so it's at many, uh, many ninjas on uh, Twitter. Uh, on this end is the uh, website IamMinnyNinjas.com, which uh, he, he needs to update the website a little bit. It looks like it's, he's got a few things that he needs to put on there. And he really needs to stop putting or having his uh, plush spider over here update the site. Can a web... Can a, does Mr. Webby really count as the webmaster? Because I've seen photos of this, this plush spider over here typing on the keyboard. I'm not sure how that works. Can it actually do that? I would think the typing speed would be great of a plush spider. Also, hopefully next week um, someone will kill both the ninja and Mr. A and I can get a proper co-host. Can you finish the plugging? Um, I myself, uh, I need to get back to doing some of my own animation work. So, assuming the ninja is in fact alive and not setting up some kind of puppet arm again here. It's like uh, many ninjas on Twitter. I am many ninjas.com for his website. I occasionally do hijack his YouTube page to put up some of my own pixel art stuff, which uh, will be appropriately labeled as such. And as far as I know, I d if he's doing anything, I don't know what it is, man. Uh, how about for you? Pretty standard stuff. At Carlos Agazar 2 to keep track on Twitter or baseball playoff related tweets because right now it's the playoffs have started. I saw the first game yesterday and I am jacked up. 12 innings of glorious sudden death live or die baseball. I like it. Oh, but for the most part, I will include updates on what movies and things we're going to do or any videos that are upcoming. That'll be there. And over here, uh, we'll, I will post the links. I I think, I don't know if I put last week's in. I may have, but if I didn't, I will put last week's and this week's links on there. I'm usually a couple of days late on this one, but I do eventually get around to it if you would like to check it out. Obviously, the YouTube page is the fastest way to see it. Um, feel free to like, subscribe, comment. Um, if you want to live the puppet dream, you can keep posting for that. You know, keep asking for it. You never know. Budgets will be a thing, but if we can figure that out, we'll certainly try. Um, and then we'll figure out what I'm, we're going to work out is we'll do the Godzilla thing for the next show and then we'll figure out the next couple of movies because I like to figure at least five or six at a time just so that I know ahead of time what's going to happen. We'll work on that. And I am working on a couple of videos that I do want to put on there and I will, I will mention that here first. I don't want to say any dates on it until I've actually got it done because I'm actually going to have to record it and then I actually intend to edit it. So it's going to be a little shorter than these videos we've been doing. 
But we'll see what happens with that. So with that said, that's it for me. Uh, for my co-host today, Mr. A, any closing remarks? Well, it's been a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure when or if I'll be appearing on this thing again, uh, unless the uh, the ninja goes on AWOL again. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, and I imagine Carlson and the ninja will be happy to read and just comment on any of the things that come below. Take care, everyone. See you later. <laughs>